Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Fold. I'm the dean of the college of working my notes. <laughs> I think well, those are mine. <laughs> uh, that's being tied to your notes. I'm the dean of the college of liberal arts, and uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce the 2013 recipient of the Lindbergh Award, and today's speaker, Professor of English Rochelle Shelley Lieber. Uh, before I do so, though, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate our 2014 winner of the Lindbergh Award, Professor Michael Ferber. <laughs> Professor Lieber earned her bachelor's degree at Vassar College and her PhD at MIT and was appointed to the UNH faculty in uh, 1981. As a scholar, Professor Lieber has achieved at the highest levels. She has built her reputation internationally in linguistic morphology, which for those of you who may not know, is the study of form and formation of words, the subfield of linguistic, uh, theoretical linguistics. Indeed, she has been a key scholar in the resurgence and development of the field in the US, and is one of the first to establish the relatively new study of generative morphology, a term I believe refers to the nearly infinite number of words that can be created from a finite set of morphemes. She has authored five books in the field and edited two. Her most recent book is the Oxford Reference Guide to English Morphology, co-authored with Laurie Bauer and Ingo Plack a weighty tome published by Oxford University Press just last year. In this book, Professor Lieber and her colleagues investigated and cataloged the way words are actually formed and used today, which yielded some surprising words that are apparently in use, such as knickknackery, bestsellerdom, post-death of God, one word, <laughs> avant-gardist, cowboyish, eyebrowism, and eyebrowless. <laughs> the former winner of the UNH Award for Excellence in Teaching, Professor Lieber's reputation in the classroom is also stellar. She receives consistently high praise for her, from her students who note especially her enthusiasm, knowledge, preparation, and respectfulness. They repeatedly applaud her for her ability to make a difficult subject fun, understandable, even joyful, so much so that one student notes, I remember being upset when class time was over. I've never felt that way about a class. <laughs> for her outstanding work as both a scholar and a teacher, Professor Lieber has been recognized with the Lindbergh Award, the Overallness Award. <laughs> for can -doism <laughs> in the college. <laughs> Her lecture today, entitled Confessions of a Morphologist, <clears throat> or How I Learned to Stop Intuiting and Love Data, <laughs> is sure to stimulate you, despite the warning from Alec Morantz, a linguist from NYU, who once wrote, quote, when morphologists talk, even linguists nap. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, and thank you for those lovely new words. I'll write them down, and thank you all for coming. I have to uh, learn to talk and use a clicker at the same time. I'll try. Uh, so I'm going to start this talk with a disclaimer. In case any of you actually thinks that I was going to confess anything as part of this talk, let me set your minds at rest. And what this talk is actually about is the interplay of methodology and theory in linguistics, but actually if I had called it that, nobody would have wanted to come. <laughs> so, um, more narrowly construed, what this talk is going to be about is a long-standing question in lexical semantics about whether it's possible in languages to have absolute synonyms, by which I mean words that mean precisely the same thing and 
um, therefore can be used in every or nearly every context in which they occur. Um, the point that I will try to make is that this is a question that has been argued forever, largely on the basis of people's intuitions about what words are possible and what words mean. And that using a new uh, methodology that has become more and more available to linguists, namely the use of vast databases called corpora, it's possible um, to actually find out um, whether our intuitions about synonymy and various other things having to do with word formation um, hold up to the actual data that we can now find. Um, all of this comes out of the research that I did with my colleagues Lori Bauer at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, and Ingo Plagg at Dusseldorf University um, in uh, Germany that culminated in the uh, uh, the publication of the book that uh, Ken just mentioned. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, a couple of preliminaries. For those of you who don't know what morphologists do, okay, the area of which I, uh, in which I do my research is called linguistic morphology. And narrowly viewed, it has to do with how native speakers of language uh, form complex words from smaller pieces that we call morphemes. For example, how it is, if we need to, we can come up with a word like non-reconstitutionalized, which is made up of seven meaningful parts that are put together according to um, a certain set of rules which we know implicitly. Now, um, narrowly viewed, what morphologists have done for at least the last 30 years is to talk about, um, try to figure out what those rules are that allow us to put together, to combine these morphemes in order to form, an, as Ken said, an infinite number of new words. In recent years, some of us have begun to take a broader view of what morphologists ought to be doing Namely, that rather than just focusing on the rules which allow us to put morphemes together, we ought to look at the mental lexicon as a whole, which of course contains those rules, but also allows us access to words that we store already formed, that we're, we um, are able to um, call up out of our store of memorized words, um, so that we can use them when we need to, when somebody uses them, we can, um, we can process them. So more broadly construed, we're looking at not only the rules of um, morphology, but also how words are stored, how they're accessed, how they're processed, and the relationships among all of those things. So that's a rather broader view of what um, morphologists do. As I go through this talk, I'm going to start out talking with simple, uh, talking about simple words, by which I mean words that consist of only a single morpheme. And then I'm going to t uh, go on and talk more about the kind of complex words that morphologists um, tend to uh, spend more time looking at. Um, and what I'm going to do is to go from the uh, the question of whether there is absolute synonymy to a theoretical principle that has been around in morphology for a long time, which is very much related to the question about synonymy called blocking. Um, and you'll see how this all fits together. But first, I want to start out with a thought experiment. Okay? This is a, a thought experiment that I often do in my intro to linguistics classes. So I'll ask a bunch of student linguists, um, take the words couch and sofa. Are they absolute synonyms? Okay, and obviously, students have never thought about this before. Okay, and everybody knows that both of these words denote an item of furniture, generally upholstered, seats more than one person. Okay? But you ask students, are these words synonyms? 
And you would be surprised what heated, a, what kind of a heated discussion you can get over this. So one person will invariably say, one is comfier than the other. Okay? Or one goes in the living room and the other goes in the basement playroom. Okay? Or one is something that's classy and the other is what we have in the frat house. Okay? And here's what's interesting about this. No one will agree, everybody will agree that they don't mean the same thing. No one will agree on what the difference is between them. A significant point. So that's what the amateurs say. Oddly, that's what the experts say as well. So if you look at these quotes, they're from relatively um, recent textbooks in lexical semantics. The first is from a textbook by Lynn Murphy, published in 2010. Um, Murphy says, words are said to be absolute synonyms if they are substitutable in any possible context with no changes in denotation or other aspects of meaning, including connotation. Using that criterion, it's easy to see that very few words are absolute synonyms. And even clearer is um, a piece that I've taken from an older but um, very well respected textbook um, by D.A. Cruz in Lexical Semantics. One thing becomes clear once we begin a serious quest for absolute synonyms, and that is that if they exist at all, they're extremely uncommon. Furthermore, it would seem reasonable to predict that if the relationship were to occur, it would be unstable. There is no obvious motivation for the existence of absolute synonyms in a language, and one would expect either that one of the items would fall into obsolescence or that a difference in semantic function would develop. Okay, so we have agreement on this. Um, we shouldn't find absolute synonyms. Okay, at this point I want to change gears just briefly and talk about methodology. You'll see how this all comes back together again. The, uh, the methodology that morphologists have typically used is a methodology that um, is common among generative linguists, people who do Chomskyan um, style linguistics. This is the school in which I was um, uh, taught and raised. And what Chomskyan linguists do is to come up with examples, um, to think about whether they are acceptable or not, um, whether they sound grammatical, whether you think a native speaker would say them. Um, if you need to consult with other people, you might ask the five people who are closest to your office um, uh, for their judgments on sentences. And um, based on the pattern of data that you find, uh, you will begin to come up with the rules of the language that uh, reflect the pattern of grammaticality of the data. The thing is that this is a methodology um, which has largely been pioneered on the basis of syntax, which is the study of how sentences are formed. So, for example, syntacticians might come up with sentences like, you saw the program, what did you see, I wonder who saw the program, what do I wonder who saw? Okay. And um, the first three obviously sound fine to all of us. And the last one um, is extremely weird. Nobody would ever say it. And all you have to do is look at it and say, nope, that one's out. And then if we're trying to come up with rules for question formation in English, we might try to figure out what it is about sen uh, sentence D that makes it weird and impossible. So morphologists, um, having been brought up for the most part in this kind of a tradition, have assumed from the get-go that using intuitions in trying to figure out what are possible words or what words mean in relation to each other, we assume that our intuitions are every bit as good as they would be for um, what syntacticians do. Okay. Um, but at a certain point, you begin to wonder whether that's the case. 
And these days, we have a way of testing whether our intuitions really are as sound as we believe they are. What we have at our, at our disposal, as I mentioned very briefly before, um, are things that are called corpora. Okay, so a corpus is a vast collection of snippets of texts or spoken language that can be searched in various, so they're all uh, they're, uh, digitalized, computerized, and they can be searched in various fair, fairly complex ways. Uh, corpora have been around for at least 20 years, if not longer, but for many years they were, first of all, proprietary. In other words, you had to pay to use them. And second of all, uh, you had to have a certain level of uh, programming expertise to be able to fish out of them what you wanted to use. Now, what changed in uh, 2008 was that a fellow whose name is Mark Davies, who's a professor at uh, Brigham Young University, made available, freely available on the web, a number of corpora, foremost among which is called the Corpus of Contemporary American English. Um, the Corpus of Contemporary American English compi compiles 450 million words of text of American English. It contains written English of all possible genres, from academic to newspaper to, you know, to all kinds of uh, things varying in um, level of formality and you know sports magazines you name it you can find it as well as spoken language so um, interviews that are transcribed and all kinds of stuff the best thing about this well two good things about um, the this corpus it's free number one number two Davies created an interface that is so easy to use that even I can use it. Okay. And if you, all you need to know are a few tricks. And by using this corpus, you can find out nearly anything you want to know about how people form new words in English. Um, there's a similar corpus available for British English, also with the same user interface. Um, I don't use it as much because it has only 100 million words. And if you're interested in historical English, uh, Davies has recently put up something called um, uh, COHA, Corpus of Historical English, American English, and you can trace trends um, from 1840 onwards in um, uh, English usage. So it's fabulous stuff. And you know, this is what allows us to really make a test with respect to our intuitions. Well. If you look up couch and sofa in COCA, okay, um, first of all, you find out that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of uses of each of these words. Obviously, I can only put up a few. This is, a, is the most I could fit into a readable slide. Um, so you have to, have to believe me that I'm not cherry picking here. But just about any context in which you can find the word couch you can find the word sofa. Okay? And it is nearly impossible. It is impossible to find any uh, principled distinction between these two words. The only conclusion you can draw are that couch and sofa are as close to absolute synonyms as you could ever get. Okay, so, um, oh, although. Somebody among you might be thinking, oh, well, there are a few idioms in which you can use one but not the other. And lest somebody want to raise your hand and say, well, what about couch potato? <laughs> I rest my case. Okay. So um, my conclusion is that both amateurs and professionals have been very reluctant to believe in the existence of absolute synonyms, but given at least this tiny bit of data from COCA, um, it might be a good idea to revise what we think. Now this brings us to uh, more closely to my area of morphology. So I end, uh, I'm much more interested in complex words than simple words. 
But the issue of synonymy nevertheless comes up there. And in fact, it has been raised to the level of a theoretical principle, which has been called blocking. Okay, so the idea behind blocking is that if you have a word, simple or complex, with a certain meaning, you should not find another complex word with the same meaning. And I'll give you examples of what this is. But first, let me just go through the definitions. So the uh, concept of blocking originated in uh, a seminal dissertation in uh, morphology, uh, Mark Aronoff's dissertation from 1976. Um, and Aronoff said, blocking is the non-occurrence of one form due to the simple existence of another. And in a recent textbook of his, he's a little clearer about what he means there. So blocking involves two expressions, one potential and one actual. We say that a potential expression is prevented from occurring because another expression with the same meaning and function already exists. And even clearer is the definition from uh, Katamba and Stonem, another textbook in morphology. Blocking may be due to the prior existence of another word with the meaning that the putative word would have, quoting Aronoff, usually perfect synonyms are avoided. Okay, so blocking is a way of working the idea of synonym, uh, synonymy avoidance into morphology. Okay, now what I want to do next is to go through a number of cases that have been discussed in the morphological literature on uh, where blocking should or should not occur. So I'll go through four cases and then, after discussing what the implications of those cases are, I'm going to go to the corpus and show you what we find on them. Okay, so case number one. Okay, <laughs> case number one has to do with what's called inflectional morphology. That's the morphology which allows us to make grammatical distinctions, such as singular versus plural or present versus past tense. Okay, so take the case of the word mouse which on the one hand can mean furry little vermin, and on the other can mean com uh, computer pointing device. Now, what I'm going to be interested in is the plural of that word. Now, I think everybody would probably be willing to say that the plural of furry little vermin is mice. Okay? But I think that you might be a little bit less sure about what the plural is for computer pointing device. And you, know, you might be willing to say that the plural is mouses, but people who uh, believe in this principle of blocking would say, if the plural of computer uh, pointing device is mouses, it cannot also be mice. Okay, so you ought to find one or the other, but not both. Okay, So that's what. Um, blocking predicts with respect to um, mouses and mice. OK, case two. That's the thief versus stealer case. So another version of blocking has to do not with inflectional morphology, but what's called derivational morphology. That's the morphology by which we form, it doesn't have to do with grammatical distinctions, it's the morphology by which we form um, new words. Okay, so for example, in English, we have a suffix er, which allows us to take a verb and make it into a noun that means the doer of the action. So from write, we get writer. Um, it also does some other things. For example, you can take a verb and make it into an instrument. Like uh, from print, you can get printer. Um, it's actually the same thing, but that's another story. Um, in any case, what blocking would tell us is that if we have a word like thief, which we clearly do, we should not also find the word stealer. Okay? So we ought not to have stealer. Um, that's case number three. Uh, number two, rather. OK. Cases number three and four get slightly more complicated because they have to do with what we call rival affixes. 
Now, because English has a fairly complex history, we have a lot of means of making new words. And some of those means uh, sort of overlap in function. So arrival affix would be a case where you have two suffixes, or it could be two prefixes, or it could be three, actually, uh, that attach to the same kind of a base and form the same uh, category of part of speech of output that means the same thing. So a good example would be the suffixes ness and itty. Uh, both of them attach to adjectives in English and form abstract nouns. Okay. What blocking, um, oh, and just let me just uh, give a historical note. And in this case, the reason that we have both of them, um, identical functions and so on, is that uh, ness is an affix which is native to English. It comes in from its basic Germanic stock. Then English um, borrowed thousands and thousands and thousands of words um, over the entire course of its history from French and Latin. And with those words, we also borrowed and began using um, prefixes and suffixes that were native to the Romance languages. So we sometimes have these duplicates because of the complex history that um, English has. And Ness and Itty um, came to be from that root. Going back to blocking, what blocking tells us is that if we have um, a particular adjective, we should be able to find an abstract noun formed either with ness or with itty, but not with both. In case we do find um, ness and itty on the same base, they would at least have to have different meanings. Okay? In other words, what you can't find is two words that mean precisely the same thing with the two different affixes. So that's, that would be um, another case of blocking. Uh, case four is another case of rival affixes. Um, it turns out that eyes and a phi are both borrowed from um, French and Latin. Um, one from French, one from Latin, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they do the same morphological work. Both attach either to adjectives or nouns and form verbs. Okay, they tend to mean um, to make something you know, into something or to, to purify is to make something pure and so on. They, all, they have the same range of meanings. So again, the idea with ness, uh, with rather eyes and if I is that you shouldn't find the two affixes on the same noun or on the same adjective, or if you do find them, they ought to mean different things. Okay, so those are four cases that anybody who's interested in blocking would want to think about. And there's been a great deal of literature on them. And the literature, by and large, tries to support the idea that blocking is real. Now we go to the corpus of contemporary American English. And we'll go through the cases in turn. So case one. Okay, now, I'm not going to worry about um, the furry little vermin meaning just yet. This is the computer pointing device meaning. Now again, you have to take my word for it that I have not cherry picked examples. Um, there are lots of examples of mice for the plural. Lots of examples for mouses as the plural. Same contexts you find them in. Not much that you can d use to distinguish them. And in case you might wonder whether you find one of the plurals predominating early on in the database, um, Corpus of Contemporary American English covers English from 1990 through to 2011 or 2012. So you might want to see if there's been a change in the use of the plural. You know, after all, you can change from one word to the other. But what you find if you look at the range of examples is that they are both in use over the entire period during which we've used computer pointing devices, so I don't know, mid-90s or so, to today. And um, they occur you know, simultaneously. People use them 
interchangeably, no meaning difference. They just both exist. No blocking. Now, of course, you might want to go back to the furry little vermin meaning and think about our intuition that you can't, you know, that, I mean, our intuition is really strong that um, if you have these little things in your basement, um, they are mice and not mouses. Okay, I'll cop to that one. Okay, here's the interesting thing. <laughs> there are at least some contexts in which, at least when we're talking about cartoon vermin, um, we have a very strong intuition that the plural is mouses. So if you go to Disneyland and there are a bunch of these guys running around in costumes, you might say to your six-year-old, look, look at all the Mickey and Minnie Mouses, right? So it, while it's true that for the normal usage of the word um, uh, mouse, our intuition is that it's, its plural is mice, um, we nevertheless find uh, usages in which you find the alternative plural. No blocking. Okay, uh, let's go on to thief versus stealer. Well, first of all, the word stealer is amply attested in the corpus of contem contemporary American English. So again, dozens and dozens and dozens of attestations such as the two you um, see here. Uh, now, somebody might say, OK, we find stealer. But maybe we find stealer in the context in which it's followed by a prepositional phrase with a preposition of. Because the two examples I've pulled there, you know, a stealer of dreams, um, the greatest stealer of other people's stories. And you'll notice that the word thief, which uh, occurs alongside stealer, um, is just occurring by itself, syntactically isolated. So somebody might say, OK, well, maybe the word stealer exists, but at least in terms of syntactic context, it might be distinguished. That is not true. <laughs> because on the one hand, you can find stealer um, independently with no modification except for uh, an indefinite article. And then you can find a thief of. So again. There seems to be no difference. And there's certainly no difference in meaning. Um, again, you'll have to take my word for it. But if you look through all of these, the meaning is um, by and large the same. Okay? Or let me be a little bit more, um, a little bit stronger about that. It's the same. Okay? It's really the same. Okay? Let me now talk about the Ness and Itty case. That one is more complex. Okay? So, um, Ness and Itty, let me say from the get-go that if you look at the corpus, you find many, many, many doublets of the same root word or base, both with Ness and with Itty. Okay, so there is no pure blocking. But if you're going to make an argument for blocking, what you then have to appeal to is the fact that there must be a distinction in meaning between the two. And indeed, Elizabeth Riddle, in an article in 1985, tried to make precisely that distinction. And what Riddle says, um, this is a little bit uh, sort of rarefied. So I'm going to read what she says and then try, try to give you uh, my interpretation of what she must mean. So um, Riddle says that Ness attaches to an adjective that denotes an embodied trait. Itty creates forms denoting abstract or concrete entities. Now, it's not entirely clear what she means by this, but my read on it is that she seems to say that words formed with itty um, give a greater degree of reification. They make the resulting word more concrete than the word with ness. That ness is just a kind of fleeting trait that you might find, whereas itty gives you something that um, has uh, a much more concrete quality. 
And she gives a number of very interesting examples that are um, at least minimally persuasive. So she gives the example of hyperactivity versus hyperactiveness, the former being a diagnosable condition and the latter being a sort of temporary state. So you, know, you might take a number of perfectly ordinary kids and they're running around after having um, had too much birthday cake and you would say the level of hyperactiveness in this, uh, this room is pretty high, whereas you wouldn't um, discuss their hyperactivity because these might not be kids who are diagnosed with a condition. Okay? Similarly for ethnicity versus ethnicness. So ethnicity is the state of belonging to a particular group the latter a superficial property or quality. So you might go into somebody's um, house and look at the decor and say, oh, I like the ethnicness of this um, decor, whereas you wouldn't say the ethnicity of this decor. Okay? Um, now again, you're going to have to take my word for it that this one example can be multiplied by dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. But if you look at the doublets you find um, of Ness and Itty on various, um, on the same bases, by and large what you find is what I have here for pureness and purity. Absolutely no difference in meaning. And um, in the Oxford Handbook of uh, um, English morphology, um, in order to establish this, we came up with pair after pair after pair. So um, I'm, I'm quite certain that uh, the predominant data that you find in the corpus is that there are pairs of words, and where there are pairs of words, they mean the same thing. Okay? So no blocking. Okay? So whatever sort of thing that uh, Elizabeth Riddle tried to pull out of the few examples are a function of a few examples that you can find and by and large the data goes in the other direction. Case four, eyes versus ify. Now this is a very interesting case because in the case of these two suffixes you do find that, um, let me state that differently, you do not find eyes and ify occurring on the same basis, never. Okay? But it is not because of blocking. It has nothing to do with the meaning of the bases that they attach to. What it has to do with is the phonological shape of the bases. So um, eyes will only attach to bases that show a trochaic stress pattern. In other words, stressed followed by unstressed. So you can get randomized. Or a dactylic stress pattern. So stressed, unstressed, unstressed. So hospital, hospitalize. Okay? Whereas if I will take a monosyllabic base, um, pure, purify, or an iambic base that's unstressed, stressed. So from bourgeois, bourgeoisify. Um, there are a few little wrinkles to this. It's not quite as simple as I'm, um, I'm laying this out to be. And if you want to know all of the various little wrinkles, you can look in the chapter in um, uh, the reference book. Um, but there is as close as you could possibly get to a pure split between these affixes on the basis of phonological form, not on the basis of meaning. Okay? So again, rival affixes, we do not find pairs, but it has nothing to do with blocking. Okay? So what is there to be said about blocking? Okay? It doesn't exist. Okay? 30 years of theorizing of morphologists and we come to find out that the principle of blocking is baloney. <laughs> okay? Now the question is what does this tell us about the mental lexicon? So why is it, for example, that the intuitions of syntacticians um, using intuitions for syntacticians tends to be a sound methodology. And why does it turn out that it's so very bad for morphologists? 
Now this has something to do with the structure of the mental lexicon. Now, linguists have been saying for a long time that sentences are rarely reused, rarely if ever reused. Now we do have a few formulaic sentences that we say like, how, hi, how are you? But by and large, every sentence that you produce, uh, that I listen to, throughout our entire lifetime will be a new sentence. Words are different. The difference with words is that they recur. Okay? Some of them don't, but the vast majority of them do. Psycholinguists have shown that even with a very minimal exposure to a new word, speakers of a language will start to form a memory trace. The more frequently you hear a word, simple or complex, the deeper and stronger that memory trace is. And the deeper and stronger the memory trace, the, easel, the more easily you have access to that word. So what is actually happening when you use your intuitions with respect to word formation and say, yes, this is a possible word, no, this is not a possible word, or yes, this must mean this, and it can't mean that, is that you're making use of frequency information that you have stored. Okay, so we do have rules which allow us to generate new words, and we frequently make use of them, but when we're tapping into our intuitions, a whole layer of frequency information interferes with that sort of pure, um, the pure rules that we have. So world, words are infinitely generable, but not all of them are as well entrenched as others. Okay? Um, this has consequences for linguistic theory. So any kind of linguistic uh, theory, or especially with regard to morphology, that is based on intuition has at least a very good chance of being on shaky ground. Okay? Um, as it has consequences for the general notion of synonymy avoidance. We don't have a good sense of what words overall can and do mean. Okay? But by looking at these vast databases, you can find examples where people have you know, maybe created a new word. They, they aren't accessing what's already uh, in the, you know, their most frequently used words. And we can catch these things on the fly as they occur. And it gives us some insight that's much better than what we have in our own intuitions. OK, so some conclusions. Oh, the mental lexicon. I forgot that slide. It's cute, but not terribly contentful. Uh, <laughs> conclusions. Number one, words are not like sentences. While our intuitions about the grammaticality or acceptability of sentences might be sound, our intuitions about the acceptability of words can lead us astray. Number two, the only way to discover this is by searching vast databases of language. And number three, um, most depressing for those of us who have spent our lives <laughs> being generative morphologists, contrary to 30 years of morphological theorizing, we find that native speakers of English and presumably of other languages do not avoid synonymy and that there is no such thing as blocking in any of its various forms. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I spent six months going through the corpus, coming up with a file of every affix in English, every prefix and every suffix, and all of the words that occurred in the corpus. Now, the corpus is not tagged to do that. You have to, by brute force, go through and do a string search and weed out all of the junk and, um, let's just say, six months hard labor. Okay? Sentences are even harder because trying to figure out how to look for such and such a construction is tricky. So have, do, are, there are some syntacticians who realize that this is an issue, that it ought to be an issue for them, but the methodology is so difficult that um, figuring out how to do it you know, is, is even trickier than it is for morphologists. So yeah, they ought to do it because I'm actually not so sure that intuition, syntactic intu intuitions are so good. All you need to do is to sit through my syntax class, <laughs> all of you guys out there, and listen to my students saying, I can't get that. Yeah. You think that's OK? No, that's not OK. Am I right, guys? Yeah. OK. Yeah, Grace? Um, Yes, having grown up knowing that nature does, you know, abhor is a synonym, mm -hmm. my head has just turned around here. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, and this is kind of beyond the scope of what you presented here, but um, the fact, you know, growing up thinking that synonyms are against the law meant having a certain kind of concept of cognitive functions. Mm -hmm. So once we realize that blocking doesn't exist, mm -hmm then does that have cognitive implications? In other words, the brain works differently, or I know we're getting beyond. Hard to tell. And you know, this is the purview of, of psycholinguists. And the kind of testing that goes on is very tricky to do. Um, I mean, I work with, with these guys sometimes. Um, you know, what it suggests is that um, the mental lexicon is far more capacious than anybody might have imagined. Our ability to both store and generate words according to rules is far more complex and intertangled than you know, we would have thought simplistically even 10 years ago. But teasing these things out um, is devilishly hard. And the, um, the early psycholinguistic kind of testing um, relied on what's called reaction time experiments. And there are all sorts of problems with reaction time experiments. More recently, people have been experimenting with eye tracking experiments where they see how, people, um, how people's eyes fix on words. And it gives them a clue to how they're accessing words. So it's fabulously interesting stuff. Okay. You know, if I were a new um, PhD minted, I would be all over that stuff. Okay. But, and I think people's views are going to be changing you know, over the next um, you know, 25 years radically on this. Um, Marino. I have a quick question. Maybe it's amateur time. But, so I understand why intuitions about uh, words that is, are unstable, right? Because, fre because of this frequency judgment. But the, the corpora is fairly young. And mm -hmm. wouldn't, it, wouldn't it also be unstable because it depends on what's been written and what words come into the language recently and what don't? don't doesn't the yeah, paper reflect what we need? OK, so let's put it this way. It's all a crapshoot. Okay. So we're dependent on what it is we find in, in the databases. For many of the things we're looking at, we're looking at rare occurrences of things. The fact that we have 40 million words okay, allows us to have a better chance at finding these things out than if we had um, 4,000 words, say. Uh, there are you know, people who try to do this research, for example, using the web, where you have billions and billions of words. That is, um, that's a little iffy because you get lots of non-native speaker English in that. And you don't know what to make of it. But you know, if you're sticking to American, you know, corpus of con contemporary American English, um, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit less fraught in that way. So you know, everything is dependent on how large a set of data you can search. The larger the set of data, the more confidence we can have in um, our interpretations. 
So but as of two days ago, twerk was not in the coca. <laughs> and we accept that it's a word now, right? But the Dalek Society has voted on it, and it's a, it's a good word. Yeah, and twerk so, will show up next year. Okay. Yeah. So, so enough people have to write it down before we can... Uh, not necessarily, because coca captures spoken language, too. It just so happens that it hasn't been... So you, um, you searched twerk? Yeah. Did you uh, did you search no, um, twerked? <laughs> did you search the lemma rather than the uh, twerk twerking twerk? We did, yeah. I, yeah. Did, then, then I saw that it was the last updated 2012. It's so. got an option. Yeah, actually, Mark Davies for some reason has stopped adding to it, which which makes me sad. Um, but yeah, you know you. Um, it, it might have it might have something to do with the fact that he stopped um, updating it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't don't you think that in some cases, at least, the fact that there are uh, I'm thinking getting out your your mouse and mice mm -hmm. uh, mouse and mouses examples mm -hmm. that it really is still in flux. Mm -hmm. I noticed it was interesting to me that the two cases that had mice mm -hmm. were from one was from uh, Good Housekeeping, mm -hmm. the other one was from uh, an education environment, and without intentionally dissing secondary education and so forth, mm -hmm. I would think that they were more into the pedagogy and not as aware of the technology and bear with me because mm -hmm. your other two examples with mm -hmm. mouses mm -hmm. one was an IBM quote mm -hmm. and the other one was CBS that was probably somebody who knew something about the field that he was reporting on yeah I didn't check for the provenance of the sources but I don't think it would be significant it just um, you know I think that just happened to be so I don't think that there's any difference in where these are used you know all language is always in flux so it could be that this sorts itself out 20 years that's from really now what I'm saying, though. It'll yeah down and then you will not have these two possibilities but the thing is that we have had stable doublets uh, of inflectional inflectional pairs like dived and dove that have maintained their existence over decades and we we've looked at this phenomenon so you know it could be that it changes but there's evidence that it doesn't have to yeah Grover did Warren Harding commit a morphological <laughs> sin when he created normalcy or are there any morphological sins no there are no morphological sins there are only people who fuss about whether it's in the dictionary or not. <laughs> and since nothing I'm interested in, you know, no, none of these words that tell us, these rare event words that tell us about how the language actually works, they don't get into the dictionary pre precisely because they are rare events. You know, so anyone who, who says, I won't consider it unless it's in the dictionary, is actually studying history and not linguistics. Yeah. Um, yeah, Alistair. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued by a phrase in the third of your conclusions, mm -hmm. presumably of other languages. Mm -hmm. My question is, have, has anyone started to work on these ideas in different languages? Um, the answer is probably yes, but not to this extent. Um, so, you know, you have to look at what language ha uh, languages have substantial corpora. Um, we do for Dutch. Um, do we have, uh, I, I, they're probably French corpora. Um, are there a large, Spanish? Um, yeah, Spanish. So, you know, you're, if you're talking about uh, modern European languages um, that are well studied, you'll probably find at least the beginnings of corpora. Whether people are doing this kind of morphological research, nobody else has published as widely on this. So I expect that um, when people read this book, they'll say, you know, oops, we've got to do this for you know, Dutch and French and whatever and revise what we think. Certainly when we get to, you know, what we might call more um, exotic languages, um, even well-studied ones like Tagalog or Mandarin or Thai or whatever, um, you know, the answer is that there's so little, you know, even, even for well-studied languages, there's so little in-depth work that we don't know. But you would assume that if English works this way, Every other language is likely to work this way as well. Diane? I just want to say I hate those Mises to pieces. You hate those Mises to pieces, <laughs> yeah. Chrissy? Um, I'm going to have to take that out of some, some phrases. But I'm wondering, uh, uh, the computer interface of this whole thing mm -hmm. is making possible 
you f this work, right? Yes. And and I'm and I'm intrigued too by the by mouse mouse is is a new term, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's brand new. What do we do with this plural now mm -hmm. of mice mouse that's not the furry with vermin, right? Mm -hmm. What do we do with it? And I'm wondering if if our changing if, if we'll find more exceptions that are n newer mm -hmm. now that we have this technology. Well, we'll find that there have been these exceptions all along. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yes. that's the one. And, and will, this, will this create more exceptions? Now we have no, I mean, well, I, like, my, my take on this is that the language works this way. You know, this is like the, pr the principle of uniformitarianism. You know, it's always worked this way. It always will work this way. It's just that we, don't ha we have not yet had the ability to, to see it. So you know, presumably, if, um, if you take um, all of the variants of all of the Shakespeare texts and do searches of this sort, you're going to find a certain amount of variation. That's, you know, that's what these people do is to try to figure out what the, you know, the, um, the ech text is. You know, and probably the answer is, you know, it's not. You know, it's, it's, it's all variation. Yeah. Um, yeah, Andy. A couple of quick things. Like on, on, on the mouse vermin issue, <laughs> um, it seems to me that when you are talking of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, you are using mouse as a family name, as a proper noun. So, oh, there goes the mouse. <laughs> Mrs. Mouse. Yeah, you know, I never thought of it that way. If you, you know, if you were hell bent on, um, uh, uh, you know, on saving that one little shred of blocking, I might give you that one. But I don't know. I'll give you another one. Yeah. Is this one worse? Um, A shudder. Yes, an, an absolute difference between sofa and couch. You cannot say so near and yet couch. me a long time. Pain, pain, pain. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Anybody else? I thought you didn't, you didn't self yeah. the right terms. What, what, what would you say about the uh, studies of child language acquisition that seem to suggest a role of blocking in children's learning of the meanings of words? It's a, fre it's a frequency effect. So you, it, you acquire the rule, and then um, you know, by virtue of hearing mice, 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 not mice, and not having mouses. I'm thinking of a know. different thing where the, uh, I mean, of course, all I know is what I've read about, you know, yeah. introductory as textbook, I, yeah. but um, uh, the experimenters give the children a set of objects, and they, they, they call them by some nonsense word. So they say, these are all the Yeah. And then they, they get, now they mix in some other different mm -hmm. sort of objects, and they say to the children, now find me the, the blocks. And the children will get the ones that have not been called uh, glitches. Mm -hmm. And the explanation I've always seen of that is that you know it is because of this blocking effect that they assume I know what a gish looks like. That's not so actually yeah. for the one. It's, uh, that's not actually blocking. That's what's called the um, uh, the lexical contrast principle. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it comes out of Susan Carey's research, and she does not call that blocking. Blocking is specifically morph morphology. So it's actually something else. That, that clearly exists. You know. Yeah. Yeah, Christina. Shai, I'm wondering, um, you mentioned that this corporate, th that he stopped collecting. So I'm just kind of wondering, what are the implications of that, or are more of these kind of sites emerging? Well, I, you know, I actually, um, I, I have, I am actually worried that he's not adding more to this because I was sort of banking on this. He, for a while, he was adding 20 million words a year, um, and then all of a sudden it stopped. And he spent his time doing another. Um, he's he's got another corpus that's called Globe, which is Global English. You know, also very useful, but for my purposes, not as useful. So I don't know what the deal is, whether it's a temporary hiatus or, uh, or what. But, but it's one person and not, not even the research team? Or it's a research team. Oh, it's a team. Yeah, he's the, he's the PI. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you.